Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are and whether you're watching live or archived. And welcome to episode number 76 of the Nautel TTT webinar series, Transmission Talk Tuesday. At least I'm getting that part right without looking. I'm your host, Jeff Welton. We're going to have a little fun today. We're going to twist things around. Instead of telling you what we as manufacturers want you to do, we're going to tell or ask you what you think we should be doing. And as always, finding people smarter than me to uh, talk about this stuff. We're going to look at this from multiple perspectives. We are talking IT security, but we're looking at setting expectations on the manufacturing side as well. Now, to talk to the manufacturing side, of course, I need somebody from the manufacturing side. So I grabbed our head honcho product manager, the handsome and talented Mr. Matt Erden. Matt, welcome. Thanks for being here. You are welcome. Glad to be here. And we just like him for the accent, but that's fine too. <laughs> um, let's see. And oh, uh, by the way, note for Mr. Disembodied Voice, Ed, Chris says the email reminder had the start time an hour late. So that's good to note. Um, anyway, uh, on the customer side, and I'm going to kind of look at this from the just the troublemaker side, but on the customer side, we've got the equally handsome and even more talented Mr. Shane Tovin. Gentlemen. Greetings. So what we're going to talk about, well, actually, before we get talking, I'm going to click a few things and set my screen up so I can see stuff. But uh, mandatory housekeeping stuff first. If you I've seen a lot of familiar names on the list, but I'm seeing one or two I don't recognize, which is usually a good sign. If you're new to our webinars, we do try to make them as interactive, interactive as possible. Um, drinking mimosas again. Uh, Elaine says, oh, I think she says Shane's drinking mimosas. <laughs> Not this nobody morning. Know, nobody knows what's in the in the uh, Nautel mug. Oh, there, Matt's got his too. Um, so if you um, have a question, comment, criticism, more comments, we're going to be looking for a lot of input today. Um, enter it into the little question window. Elaine, Chris, Jerry, several people have found it already. Marco uh, hopped in early to say hello. But uh, enter, enter your question in there or comment, whatever, hit the send button, it'll pop up on my screen and uh, I'll make it part of the conversation. Um, I may edit it for uh, public consumption, depending on how frisky you get in the comments, but we're gonna have some fun with it. If you have a microphone and you're not shy, hit the little hand wavy icon. I'm not above unmuting people and bringing them in on, on the mic as well. If you're an SBE member, not tell webinar does qualify for half of a uh, recertification credit under category I of the research schedule. Oh, still haven't filled in my form. My certifications due January 1st. No time, no pressure. Anyway, so that's what we're talking about. Now, the one thing that we do when you register, there was a chance to ask advanced questions. And sometimes we get a lot. Sometimes we don't get very many. This week, we only got one. And I've always promised that I'll always answer the advanced questions. I can't turn myself into a liar today. So my mother's maiden name for all those looking for password hints is the same as her married name and the same as her widowed name, it's Lynn. Um, what's her last name? Not telling you. Uh, what street did I grow up on? Well, the street that I was born on that I use for password recovery, can't remember. And the street I grew up on didn't have a name, it was just number 204. Uh, there you go. So I've answered the questions. Curtis, uh, good luck with your uh, hacking. By the way, I did remove my uh, network IP address from the slide down the road that you're going to see in a bit. So there you go. All right. So what started this whole conversation um, was a discussion in the uh, PubTech, Public Radio Technical mailing list. And somebody had brought up the NPRM that the FCC put on for uh, EAS. Now, what triggered that, Shane? Well, I think uh, one thing that triggered it was, uh, uh, many of you probably remember a while back, we had the zombie alert that were issued uh, up in Montana and several other places. Um, that was a particular manufacturer's box where uh, the, uh, several customers had left the default credentials in place. And of course, once you get into that uh, interface, you can do anything, uh, including make up zombie alerts. So that was, uh, that was I think, one of the big ones. Um, uh, that was the one that kind of put it on the radar, I think, of the FCC. So. Yeah, and that was one of the uh, the huge uh, huge ones. But I mean, going even further back, uh, pre 2017, if uh, 
you had an, an IP codec from a certain manufacturer, the default username and password was no username and password. So as long as somebody had the IP address, they had full access to whatever. And coincidentally, a lot of folks use IP codecs to get the audio from the studio to the transmitter site. So anybody with the right IP address could very cheerfully intercept, change the source audio to whatever they wanted to, and then set it a password and lock it totally out. Now that was in 2017. This is almost 2023, so five and a half, six years later, and I'm here to tell you that if you search for that username, you will still find some of those units with no username and password, never been updated. So that's the one where we're going to throw some of this back in y'all spaces. You got to do your updates <laughs> and change the defaults. But when we got going into this conversation, um, I saw this and uh, one of the slides that I like to put up quite a bit. Um, so I started looking, and so it, it, it was uh, DASDEC, by the way, that uh, was the, the one that had the issue in 2019, and they did patch it pretty quickly. And uh, so I did a search ooh, probably about two months before this uh, NPRM was issued, and uh, there were several hundred DASDECs visible on the internet. Today, down to 11, so as, and, and that's as of about two hours ago. So as you can see, obviously, if nothing else, the, uh, the visibility has made a difference for DASDAC, at least. Now, we still got room to go, and uh, that's where we're kind of looking at this. So Matt, you're the, uh, the production guy. I mean, obviously, any time we do anything to increase security, and, I, and I've got a, uh, a big old uh, a screed that you wrote uh, in response to one of Shane's <laughs> emails, but, uh, but there are a lot of factors involved. Um, I mean, we're dealing with everything from folks that uh, have, can develop their own network to folks that, I bought a toaster, I want to make toast. Right. Now, and how do you work with that? Well, I, I think it's collaborative. So I think that our job is to give you the right pieces to assemble something that is secure and to not prevent you from doing that. So mm -hmm. if we build into the product the ability to do something, we can, we're leading the horse to water at this point. And uh, then it's up to um, the users to sort of take advantage of what we've laid out. Um, yeah. And then the flip side of that is, what are we, what are we missing? What, what didn't we do that you're kind of looking for? You're sort of clutching around looking for, for a specific tool, and we're not providing it. Then that's a bit of a problem. And you know, it starts for me. It started with something as simple as in the new AUI. You know, the old AUI, the default admin user was Nortel, no password, and uh, that struck me as kind of not a great idea. And uh, some in our customer service department have decided that my, my new password is a little bit uh, passive aggressive. Um, but at the same time, I think it's helpful in the sense that uh, the new password is admin. So you know exactly the kind of password you're dealing with, that it has the full privileges. And the password is change underscore me. And so hopefully that helps people to sort of go, yeah, I really ought to do that. You can still choose to ignore me. It'll be easy to remember, but uh, we we highly recommend that you uh, to do now, that. Mind so, you, your, your your 300 watt demo, your VS 300, that's uh, I think right behind you in the that one, 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 one corner or another. On yeah, yeah. As I recall, the um, name of the preset that's currently running is no default password. Yeah, not anymore. I fixed that because as ah, soon as you, you did that to me, I changed the password. So good luck in guessing that password. <laughs> Excellent. It has See, a very so we, good we can password. play this game amongst ourselves as well. Um, exactly. Ray Lewis in the comments. And, and for what it's worth, the VX behind me is not running, so you can't hack that one quite yet. <laughs> uh, quite quite yet. Yeah. Now, um, in in the comments, uh, Ray Ray's mentioned that the IT department at my day job loved the four internet hardware firewalls. Not sure what the hardware costs and monthly costs are. Has anyone used this? What are the approximate costs? And that that's kind of above and beyond what uh, what we're going on. I can tell you from a user perspective, we use uh, four internet for our VPN, and uh, it's 
seems to be reasonably secure. It's secure enough. It's a pain in the rear to get into. And uh, I, I tell people, basically, the harder it is for the user to use, the harder it is for the hacker to hack. And uh, that's the, you know, that that's your, if it's really easy to use, it's probably really easy to compromise. So Jeff, that, what, that's, uh, can you repeat that question again? What brand was he using? Uh, Fortinet. Fortinet. Oh, he's going to Fortinet. Okay. 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 Yeah. And I mean, ultimately, whether you're looking at Fortinet, Sophos, uh, Palo Alto, I mean, those are all the top of the top when it comes to uh, IT security. So right. you know you're going to pay you're going to pay a little more, but you're going to have a lot more power from it. Now, right, and I mean, gonna... go ahead. I was going to say it is pretty common now that a lot of these manufacturers of, uh, of well any number of things are now going to kind of uh, something as a service basically. So even if you buy the hardware, you can pretty much count on at least for anything beyond the most basic of functionality, paying something to that manufacturer for ongoing. Um, updates support uh, and all and maybe some enhanced features and all of that sort of stuff it's yeah. just right. it's just the direction things are going and you know it's uh, and i can understand why so yeah i imagine that the uh some of the even the big ones they they allow entry level sort of uh versions of their software so if it's up to 10 users or something then and that might meet a lot of people's use and a, a good way to get your foot in the door and as you grow you can do that if if you're in growth mode so Right. Uh, Kirk Harnack from uh, Telus Alliance. Hey, Kirk, um, is uh, in in the audience, and uh, he's uh, made a, a good good uh, point here. What do you think of manufacturers forcing users to set a, a strong password, at least on equipment that'll likely be internet exposed? <laughs> and, and he uses as an example the the MPX node where you can't use it until you set a strong password. So basically, right now, for example, like if I take a VX series transmitter and plug it in it says hey uh, what power level do you want me at what's my audio source um you know what's my frequency and then you're good to go well you know should we be adding this step please assign a user password at least 16 characters with one uppercase one lowercase one smiley and emoticon and the initially your dog's last <laughs> name i mean or words to that effect so so matt what's what's your response to that um we had a very long think about this and uh, and decided that given that the number of people that hadn't even added a password at all, that to force it and then, you know, basically put people in a position where now they've got to figure out how to reset their password. And if the safest, securest way to do that, any guesses? Go to the transmitter site and hit a big button on the front of your transmitter because anything remote is going to be a little potentially sketchy. Um, so what we had thought about, which we got rid of, was the idea in the early in this phase one was the idea of having uh, email-based uh, accounts so that you could do a password reset. The complexity around that means. He, you actually have to have email set up on your transmitter first. So, you know, it's it's uh, you know it's it's trying to figure out which comes first. So, um, we would love to be able to sort of encourage uh, better and you know best practices. Um, but I think at this point, for the kinds of you know machines that we're talking about, that that would I think create a, a pretty big hue and cry against it. Um, so we're holding off, and right now we're just using change underscore me. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. From a no, user perspective, um, uh, mm -hmm. from a user perspective, I kind of have you know, I kind of have mixed feelings about uh, about that. I mean, uh, I, I I love strong passwords. I love password managers, but uh, if you force uh, most users to do that to a piece of equipment that they only see maybe you know a handful of times, uh, you know, a year. Um, this is how you end up with sticky notes and uh, P-touch on your transmitters with the password right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, or, or, so you're better you know, off. Like you said, yeah. a, a sticky note on the monitor when they are um, got a TV news camera filming to see why you accidentally triggered an atomic bomb alert, um, mm -hmm. which uh, happened in uh, a state not too far, well, not too terribly far west of you. Uh, now, uh, Kirk Harnack is in the audience, as I mentioned, and Kirk's got another question here, and uh, this is one near and dear to my heart because it's something that we do at uh, my station. So, Kirk, I'm going to unmute you, 
And uh, if you can um, grab your microphone and ask the question about putting the, so that the question was about putting a PC at a transmitter site to assist with remote access. Of course, now, of course, Kirk's probably uh, typed the question and then gone off to answer a phone call. But uh, I'll, I'll keep an eye on when I see him turn green, we'll bring him in. Um, so he asked about um, putting the PC oh, hey, at the hey. site. Oh, there you are. There it is. Hi, Sorry. Yeah, I, I guess uh, when you said uh, I'll unmute you, that means that you'll give me the ability to unmute myself. Yes. Okay. Uh, got gotcha. you. Yeah. Hey, thanks for this uh, great session. I appreciate it. Yeah. So I've got a few transmitter sites where I, for various reasons, I've elected to place a PC there. I've had it rather amazingly good luck. I placed some cast off PC running. Uh, well, I guess they're running Windows 10. Um, but I've, uh, I enjoy the convenience of accessing them with either TeamViewer or my remote access of choice called dwservice.net. And um, it just seems to make my life easier to have a PC at the transmitter site. Now, a lot of folks would cringe at that, and, and I get that. And not all my sites have a PC at the site. Um, uh, I can come think of it, a, a few that don't. Uh, are actually on my LAN. They're not on public internet because they're an IP radio link out there. Um, right. So I try to avoid port forwarding whenever I can. And if I do port forward to something, it's got to have, you know, be as secure as I can make it in terms of, of password security. I don't know what vulnerabilities a manufacturer might have, you know, beyond the password. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to get your thoughts about um, at, at some sites, I've got a PC, and that's how I check on all the stuff at the site, typically. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's an outbound connection, something at the site that phones out, you know, so to speak, um, that, that's fine. That's typically very secure because routers will let something out. They'll open a port. They'll only allow things back in that came from the destination. So that's that's typically not an insecure way to do it unless somebody wants to educate me Otherwise, but anyway, just your thoughts on a PC at the site to to make remote access uh, convenient and secure. I'll start. I'll go with that one. Um, actually, I've done that before, and it's it's great. It really is a convenient way to have access to various things at your site. Now that said, that PC, especially if it does have internet access, is going to be subject to the same types of security risks that any other PC will. Um, and in addition to uh, you know uh, being interrupted by uh, Inoppor inopportune timed updates uh, and uh, various other things. Um, now, again, all that said, um, the direction that things are kind of going, at least in my world, is, uh, is virtual. So you will inherently have, uh, in those cases, a PC out at your site running some kind of virtualization environment, which is basically components of your, uh, your air chain. In fact, that's what I've got running behind me right now. I've got an audio processor and remote control running on a virtual system. Uh, out in American Samoa, of all places, Kirk, uh, you know it well. Um, why not try something new halfway around the world, of course. <laughs> so, uh, but I mean, that uh, that is my audio processor, my STL, my remote control, and it allows me remote access to all of the other equipment on site. And I can get to all of that through a web browser behind the VPN. So it's it's great. Um, so yeah, I mean, conceptually, that's, that's a great idea. I would recommend, though, if you, all you need is like browser access, maybe do something like a Linux-based OS, a really lightweight Linux-based OS instead of Windows. Yeah. Um, that minimizes the chances that you'll be burned by Windows updates uh, and uh, have it just kind of, you know, shut down or restart at an inopportune time. So, yeah, now that doesn't uh, come without its own concerns. No, and, absolutely. Uh, I've got, got a slide about that down the road because historically it used to be, and I mean, I've got two Linux machines in the house at the moment, actually, one in, in the house because the boy has got the other one at school with him. That's his uh, daily driver for schoolwork. But uh, the, historically, it used to be way, way back in the early days of Ubuntu, Linux was awesome because you had security through obscurity. Nobody knew it existed so there was very little attempts these days where it's become much more prevalent that's not quite i mean that you can get a false sense of security from that so you you need to keep an eye out for that too um i i mentioned that uh with uh kirk setup i we do something similar we uh we use a vnc which is arguably not as good as a vpn but knock on wood so far it's been okay and um, we've got dedicated fiber to the transmitter so that's uh a little little better there so we vnc into the studio and then uh, ride the fiber out to the site but uh but yeah it's um it's definitely a concern um somebody uh jay Coles, uh why not 
force it change, but at the screen, give a choice to either use the default password or enter one of your own. And I guess in, in some cases where you're VPN protected and want to leave it at the default, that could be an option. So uh, if, if I don't hit anything that somebody has mentioned in the comments, it's because I, I saw it and said, oh, that's a good note for Matt to use for future reference <laughs> and just left it at that. Um, Marco mentions they put the MPX nodes in and like the fact that they had to set the new password. So uh, definitely that. And, and Kirk had also mentioned using a password manager and I've got one as well um, because the older, oh, and Ben's mentioned the same thing. Um, it, it's just, yeah, uh, it's a, a bigger challenge to um, to remember this stuff as I get older and where they some of them need to be cycled on a regular basis. There's a question though for uh, Shane. Um, I'm going to call out uh, not necessarily our current IT guys. It's our, our IT policy, I guess, that we do three-month revolving passwords. Um, you have to change it every three months. Can't use the same one that you've used for the last six iterations. So, you know, you take the old one and add a one to the end or whatever, because that's really secure. Um, <laughs> Or, or um, do like William said earlier and just call, make the password, please hack me one. <laughs> but uh, so what, what's your um, thoughts on being a forced uh, schedule changing passwords? So we have a similar approach, at least for the desktop systems around uh, around my uh, my office. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've actually, I used to be one of those who would just add, a, you know, add a character or, you know, increment a number or something, but I've gotten away from that. Um, mm -hmm. Now what I do is I just use past phrases. Past phrases are very secure because you just have a series of words that are easy to remember. Uh, I mean, you can put, you know, you can mix the case if you like, you know, put the first word of every, you know, first letter of every word is uppercase or something, put a special character at the end of it. Um, I mean, I've, I've really found that, uh, you know, that that is, uh, you know, kind of a great approach to, uh, to password management. So the biggest challenge is if you forget your passphrase. <laughs> right. Well, and I mean, my that's, current password. Say my current password is new password. I mean, there are a lot of ways you can change that. So, uh, you know, um, William has posted an XKCD comic in the uh, questions. I'll get Ed to throw that into chat so everybody can grab it. Um, and William asked us, so I was talking that we access the studio with a VNC and he's like, don't you mean VPN? And so VNC virtual network connection versus uh, VPN virtual private network. What's the difference, Shane, and why, why is a VPN? Big different? difference. Big difference. Yeah. Uh, VNC is basically just a, uh, it's basically just a remote desktop type of protocol. Um, and it's not inherently secure. In fact, inherently, it's pretty unsecure. Um, there are newer versions that offer more security. You can add cert security certificates to cover it with SSL and all of that fun stuff. Uh, but a better approach is VPN because not only does that uh, secure the connection, I mean, you you actually, you cannot, you literally cannot get to anything behind that firewall until you log into that VPN. So VPN actually gives you access to the devices themselves rather than having to hop through some other system. I mean, for instance, if that system is down, well, what do you do? You're out of access entirely. You can't get into your systems. With a VPN, right. on the other hand, you still, even if one device or that one PC is uh, is non-operational, you could still get into the rest of those devices because they're they're just there on your network and once you VPN in it's as if you literally are connected to that network and that's what we use at the office for testing different systems so sometimes I want to compare what I'm doing in the AUI with something on a GV or on a on an NX or something so I VPN into the office and then someone tells me the IP address of the transmitter I can log into its AUI and have a look and yep. take screen yeah, practice. Exactly, and I do, I do the same thing with the equipment in my lab. I mean, I'm able to get into anything either around our network or within my lab just by VPNing into the network, which is really, really and, cool. And that's uh, using the Fortinet, uh, you know, VPN that we talked about earlier, and right. uh, that yeah. works That works really quite nicely. Yeah, we have a Cisco a solution here, but yeah. 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 Uh, let's see, Marco mentions that going back to what Kirk was talking about, he has a PC at each transmitter site. Um, Kirk and Chris both mentioned that uh, that frequent changing, uh, and Kirk uh, mentioned that, uh, yeah, just because of people writing them down, but frequent changing tends to be less secure is the, is becoming the, the general line of thinking. And uh, I think it was Ars Technica or one of the, uh, yeah. you can, uh, I think it was Ars Technica did an article about it. 
yeah. several years ago and proving that uh, yeah, being forced to change your password is probably less secure. Um, it, yeah. it doesn't. It doesn't end up being better. And uh, and right. I think the, it's better to have a good strong password. And just yeah. And and there's a balance. I mean, it's okay. I mean, I would say personally, if I had my druthers, I'd say at least once a year, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, forcing people to change it like every three months or something, or even every you know, heaven forbid, every month. Oh my goodness. Um, you know, that, yeah, that's a recipe for having the password written on a sticky note and pasted to your monitor. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and I mean, more and more, like I said, one of my cell phones has a uh, an encrypted password keeper in it. You've got to use biometrics to get to the phone to unlock the password keeper program. And then from there, you can go in and get the passwords. And as long as you remember to update them, which, uh, again, right. if you're changing them every month, may or may not happen. Uh, my run and joke, the uh, company credit card, I get the statement every month. Um, typically, because all of it's automatically imported into our uh, into our account uh, expense account reconciling program, I, I typically don't look at the statement. On the rare occasion, if I've got a discrepancy, I've, I need to. So every time I go to log into the company credit card, my uh, username is my email and my password is forgot my password. Um, just click the link for forgot my password. They send me a default. I log in with that. And then three, four months later, when I need to get in again, I um, forgot my password. That That's my password for that account. I think you use the same expense reconciling system I do. <laughs> I just exactly but, same but to be fair, my banking system now actually has the verification through text as the default one that they want you to use. And in fact, they won't right. let you set the default to anything else. So... Um, and so I have to manually switch it to questions. You know, I, I'll answer a question because I don't want to. I don't want to deal with my phone. So um, you know, mine but, is um, verified through uh, through the um, authenticator on the phone, and the authenticator on the phone requires biometrics to access right. the authenticator. And, and I have that on my on my phone. I, I use the biometric, but on the desktop version of it um and, and that's I, something curtis asked and by the way curtis gets credit for uh calling me out with the uh with um the um the password hints at the beginning when he was asking about mom's maiden name and all that um but uh understanding the drawback and not being able to use it remotely what are the thoughts on biometric passwords more or less secure i, I think arguably I, more secure different type but, of hacking <laughs> yeah yeah no i i i love biometrics actually i mean i've got my uh, you know i've got my iphone now and it's got the face id and all that fun stuff the fact that i could just look at my phone and unlock it or you oh. know manage my passwords that way i mean it's it's really cool the best now, security the challenge is, with biometric right. with facial id and, and apple is uh, especially if you've got uh, version 12 or higher with the mask recognition um, my son can unlock my iphone so <laughs> there you go um, that is a challenge. Yeah, the the right. earlier ones used fingerprints, but yeah, with Face ID, I mean, and they're constantly tweaking that algorithm too. Um, yeah. So you know, that's um, I, I right. find now that you know I used to have to look at it straight on, and now I can even just glance at it, and it still gets it. You know. Yeah, the iPhone, the new security. I mean, they take make you take the picture from all the different angles until right. It took me half an hour. I uh, invented some new words, but uh, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, using the fun. But I say the funny thing is my 30 year old can my 30 year old can unlock my uh, my iPhone my work iPhone he can't unlock my Samsung my personal ride because it's uh, fingerprint I, I never mm. set up facial so so yeah I'm, I'm a big fan of biometrics too but understand that there are still potential limitations oh this is a good point to bring up two-factor authentication um, the best system the best security is something you have and something you know um, yep. Okay, and then I guess a third fact would be something you are. That's the the biometrics, basically, or right. you know, falls yeah. in the same category as something you have. But yep. um, you know, two factor authentication brings up a whole other set of uh, considerations. Uh, for instance, like if you're using SMS as your two factor authentication, SMS is easily spoofed and hacked. Uh, there are stories actually of people who have. Um, uh, you know, kind of uh, hijacked someone's cell phone number to get the, those SMS messages. And instead of the bank SMSing the user for, to ask for the recovery, they SMS this other person thinking it's the user. And right. that other, you know, the hacker is into your all your accounts. So. Right. 
Um, and Kirk, Kirk makes a good point here about uh, VPNs that uh, a, a lot of folks think that a VPN can improve the network connection. And, and ultimately, the VPN is only as good as the pipe it's installed on. And exactly. because it requires overhead of its own, you're typically going to be a little slower. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, and that's uh, one point where, where remote desktop or VNC, any kind of remote desktop technology into some remote host can help with that. So. Right. So I was doing a little hunting around, and uh, of course, there's always the the gotchas. And this was one of those situations, like you, we were talking about forcing a user to set a password. But the challenge is, when that contract engineer leaves and another one comes in, then the next guy doesn't know the password, and he has to call the factory, and you need a way to to reboot the password. And again, that by de definition. Now, a hidden backdoor program is, is uh, you know, one that the user doesn't know about. Um, but uh, either way, anytime you have a backdoor, you've got a hole. So uh, that, that's another challenge. Well, so, and one of the things that we did in the new AUI was to sort of make it much easier to create user accounts. So if you've got a contractor, you create a user account for them. If it needs to be an admin or have this permission or that permission, you give them that. The second they leave, you just kill the account. And that you yeah. never share the admin account that is the, 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 the one that you care about yeah. the most. Right. Um, and and, and that's, that's, that's a good practice. And that's a key thing. This is one of the things I beat this drum before, I'll beat it again and I won't stop beating it. We need to start treating passwords and user accounts like the keys to the building. Yeah. You know, if Absolutely. somebody leaves, then their key gets deactivated, whether it's a key card or if it's a physical key, you take the key back. So, you know, by the same token, you need to deactivate their account or change passwords to anything they've got. And, and um, to continue yeah. the analogy, if it's a card, there are certain rooms or areas of the building that that card won't get them into. So right. you actually Zero give trust. them the appropriate privileges to get to where they need to go, and then the rest of it, you just kind of leave it out. Yeah. So, so I'm, we, we got somebody else in the audience who's uh, pinging me with some comments. I'm the uh, vendor. And I'm going to uh, unmute Alex now because Alex Hartman is. Oh uh, boy! <laughs> so Al Alex, uh, you should be. There you go. You turned green. So you'd made a comment. Uh, let me scroll up a little bit. Yeah, blame the vendor is always the fun part. Um, but where did it go? Uh, VPN appliances. There. Yeah, VPN appliances with hardware crypto acceleration. Tell me a story. Well, uh, you find out really quickly how much that overhead costs you uh, in bandwidth uh, just because by nature of VPNs, they're encrypted. Well, if you're encrypting and decrypting purely in software, that comes at a cost. So make sure if you're doing a, a even a small deployment, make sure that your hardware, whether it's FortiGate, D-Link, I don't care, uh, as long as there is a a cryptography accelerator portion of that hardware to take that load off of running it in software and you'll actually get closer to wire speed. Right. And yep. and that yes. was that's a good point because I know like I've got a, a shiny new to me computer and it, it replaced a much less new to me computer which uh we um, typically didn't uh I, I I typically avoided the VPN because logging into the VPN I mean, it would slow me down to two steps above DSL. If you're and, doing a uh, full, if you're doing a full tunnel and you're relying on the far end's internet and you're encrypting every packet going to Google, yep. it's yep. gonna hurt. I was yep. just gonna mention that. That was the other. That's the other thing to note about VPNs. Depending on how they're configured, some of them, once you're connected, do not allow access to local resources, and you can imagine why. I mean, they want to isolate that remote nest network from any potential compromise on your local network. Um, so, I mean, and, and it's a valid approach. I mean, some still allow you to split tunnel, as they call it, where you can have your, your internet traffic going uh, directly, whereas uh, only the traffic to your uh, your remote uh, site is encrypted and uh, tunneled yeah. over the VPN. Uh, the split tunneling is also highly dangerous. It can be. Because depending yes. on how it's implemented, you can have, you know, don't cross the streams, so to speak. This is where you have to trust your network administrator wholeheartedly that 
if you do something like click the wrong thing on a split tunnel, it's going to catch it right as it hits the VPN and block you right there, whether it be Sophos or Palo Alto or yeah. Fortigate. It's inspecting everything coming through that tunnel. Yeah. yeah. I mean, is it annoying to not be able to print to a local network printer while you're on a VPN or connect to some local rack device while you're on a VPN? Sure. You know, but I mean, that's that's kind of the price you pay for, uh, right. you know, for that type of security. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the other thing that you can do, too, and I mean, I do this typically on my laptop is, I mean, I'll dual NIC so I can uh, Wi-Fi into the printer beside my laptop while I'm connected to the VPN. And, and that's I mean, certainly that's, another valid approach. Yeah, I mean, Multi-homing the host can also work too, but... Yeah. That has its own risks, you know, or it does, can right. have its own risks, yeah. So, so there, um, there's plenty thing, of things to pay attention to when you're doing VPN deployments. Right, and one of the things, uh, and I want to bring this up while I've still got you here, Alex, uh, but um, Ray had mentioned they use uh, biometric, then BitLocker, then two-factor in all series, and wonder why folks spend about complain about time spent logging in. And I mean, we do the <laughs> oh, wow. same thing. This, this new laptop, you know, I turn it on the first time it's turned on in the morning. There's a six-digit code to, to open BitLocker, and then there's the uh, the password that it comes on every time it goes to sleep. Now, uh, Alex, you folks at WBPR or W shoot W Wisconsin Public, you've um, you've got hardware dongles for your multi-factor, don't you? Yep. Yeah, we there's two ways we can do it for MFA. We have um, the more the merrier, I guess our, our IT security team likes. So we have you know the uh, the OTP keychains, the the RSA dongles that give you the six-digit code, and then uh, our cell phones are tied to that same MFA for thumbprint. Uh, plus the password. So yeah, the, the, and depending on how deep in the inside the network I need to go, whether it's you know the file server or the core networking config, I have to do that multiple times with multiple devices. Right. right. And I, right. I, I give you an example. So if I'm logging in in the morning, I turn on the computer, I enter the BitLocker password, I enter the password to access the computer itself. Then I um, click on FortiGate to open the VPN link. Then my phone vibrates and I use Facial ID to uh, unlock the phone. And that allows me to approve the connection to the VPN. And that's how I get into the office every morning. Yep, um, it's something you have. Hell out of a 45 minute, yeah, I say it yeah. still beats the hell out of a 45 minute drive. It does. <laughs> exactly. So, and if you're not and, a and network administrator that trusts you enough, they just deploy a piece of hardware and it's a site-to-site -site thing. And Right. <laughs> Mark, Mark yeah. says when we have to pee in a cup to get into our computer, we've gone a little too far for security. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, yeah, it's a bit much for me too. So, <laughs> But uh, so that that's the kind of thing. And, and like I've got the list over here of the uh, top five uh, vulnerabilities based on uh, CompuQuip. And of course, we're talking VPNs, so we're dealing primarily with the unencrypted data right now. Uh, security bugs, I mean, and this is the big challenge. And, and so this is, we were talking, um, and especially in broadcast, it's a huge issue between um, forced updates and update whenever you feel like it. And, right. uh, you know, I think Windows 11 has got the, a decent compromise and I mean, of course, for the Windows stuff we use at, at the broadcast facility, we use LTSC, so we can tr totally control when or if you get updates at all. But uh, with stuff like Windows 11, it um, you can postpone for up to X number of days. I think I'm allowed to go up to a month on uh, on the Pro Series that I'm running at home. So uh, yeah, that, that a compromise there, but. Uh, so there's a question for Matt. Uh, when a zero-day exploit comes in, what do we do? Or do we With, just rely on them to firewall everything? For for what what component? Um, okay, so you got a Linux kernel and a transmitter. Yeah. Um, say there's a Linux zero-day exploit. Um, at this point, it would require an update. So we would incorporate that in the next build, and then that would go out. Uh, one of the things that we investigated intensely early on in the in the pro in the program of doing the new AUI was how often do you like up doing updates? And uh, the answer was, well, never is best. Um, and then you know maybe once a year if you force me to. Um, but you know every month or so I'm gonna not like you very much. So we have to strike that balance. So uh, we. 
uh, what we spent our time doing with with the new version of AUI was to improve the way that the software updates happen. So we use something called Mender, and Mender allows us to have an A and a B installation. So the A one, for instance, might be your live one, and that's what you're running your transmitter on. When you choose to upgrade, it will download the software to the transmitter, perform the update on the B partition, if you like, and then do a try to try and switch from A to B. So the whole first part of that process is done while the transmitter is actually on air. So, and then the trying part where it says, oh, I got a new partition that's ready to roll, it's got updates, and if it's successful, it just does that. And then the transmitter reboots and you're up and running. So the process of doing an upgrade actually only takes a few a number of minutes i don't know what the actual number is yeah um but if it fails it just flips back to partition a again so it's a more robust b takes a lot less time and it's doing the best we can to sort of reduce the load of and the annoyance of doing an update if i were to do a similar thing on say my my vs over there yeah, it's very hard to point like this. Anyway, that, uh, if I were to do that in OS recovery, then now I'm at a point where, or th that can take up to, you know, half an hour or 20 minutes or something like that, depending on how, how big the update is. I, I don't have it on the top of my head. But that versus a few minutes is, is, a, is a big deal. So if I ask the same question of someone who is running the new AUI, they may turn around and say, oh, well, uh, if you're going to provide me with zero day updates, then I would say I would be comfortable with once every three months or whatever. So now we've changed the way it happens sufficiently that it might be something that you're 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 willing to take the uh, the hit. Um, and I mean, we still get a lot of the everything's working, so I haven't updated it from version one. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And and so. who can blame people? But and, and really, it depends on how firewalled the transmitter is in the first place. So if you're doing all of the work outside of the transmitter to protect it, then maybe the transmitter, you're going to just go, I don't care how old it is, it's fine because I'm protecting it. Um, yep. On the other hand, if you're like me, where you've got <laughs> a VS connected to you know, the public internet through a firewall and port forwarding, maybe you know I'm skirting with some troubles there um yeah. but i know the vendor so uh, if it gets blown up then i can just take it in <laughs> well, that brings oh, me to get a, a, get a new one for those mountaintop sites yeah you know, that uh, exactly once a year you know, yeah just exactly play so. a part yep well and, and that's an update a from mender on a mountaintop site or do you want to be there in person before you click go and again yeah, that's, that's one of those things as we as we improve the way things work you need to develop that level of trust in the system and once that level of trust is achieved and you're you're okay with that then that becomes your choice uh until that time and i I've, I've said this to the guys at work is like i'm paranoid i'm standing in front of the transmitter and i'm plugging yep. the usb in and i'm doing it by hand while it happens and i'm going to watch every second of it um, yep. But uh, yeah, that was so, a conversation you and I had last week. You're like, uh, do you, you really need the ability to update from the front panel? And it's like, not just yes, but heck yes. Yeah, I, exactly. I, especially for the first couple, I absolutely need that ability. Yeah. And um, that's our but, that's our default number one sort of thing is that you've got to be able to stand there and do it. And then the AUI is kind of the secondary one. And, right. uh, and, and, and as keep, you develop the trust, yeah. We got a lot of comments, so I'm going to grab some of them. But uh, Keith had uh, asked about using devices like YubiKey for two-factor ID. And uh, Alex, that comes back to what we were talking about with you with the dongles, correct? Yep. Yeah, I mean, uh, MFA is offered by pretty much every service out there these days. Google yep. Authenticate, uh, whatever your employer's vendor of choice is. I know like Chris Tarr uses uh, 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 the Dell guys. Uh, why can't I think of their firewall name? No one liked them. <laughs> That's why. Uh, but um, you know, they they all have that option. Um, yep. Whether it's a soft uh, MFA token or a physical token of some kind, or a combination yeah. thereof, right. that's kind of become the norm now. And I mean, it's gotten to the point where 
I leave for Thailand tomorrow morning. I don't know how I'm going to get into work because they geo block everything outside of the US. So I had to contact my firewall administrator and say, hey, I'm going here. What do I need to tell you to get into work? So, you know, what what do you, what needs to happen there? Well, does he have a static IP address? It's Thailand. No, those don't exist. <laughs> uh, you know, the, does he have a, a Dyn DNS? Yes, cool. We can use that because the firewall can check the Dyn DNS for an IP address and using the MAC address from your client, knowing that it'll connect on the VPN, boom, you're in. So I can match these four things plus your OTP and you can get in from anywhere in the world. Right, and, and again, that's just one of those as we go forward with uh, increased security as this becomes a bigger deal. Just a little side note, 2021, because we're not out of 2022 yet, 2021 on average worldwide, there was a ransomware attack every 11 seconds. Mm -hmm. Just for what that's worth. And if it's a win. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, now let's see, talking about updates, uh, Curtis mentioned that Windows 10 can also pause for about a month and Kirk mentions that Win 10 Pro lets you to stop updates via, via the group policy editor. And uh, oh. now, going to quantify that, don't ever stop <laughs> the updates, but at least at that point you pick so when it's convenient There's a caveat to, to all of these, Microsoft has a way around your group policy updates and that is yes. if they push it as a zero day security patch. It will ignore right. your settings and force yeah. a security patch. Yeah. Now, so, if, again, if you're running a device with embedded Windows uh, LTSC or LTSB version, then that's up to how it was configured at uh, it, it, by the OEM, because they can still, even on the zero days, bypass the updates. Well, they actually, even on LTSC and LTSB, they still install, but they don't reboot. Ah, there you go. Right. So they, they, they also, apply on the next reboot. Yeah, it's also worth noting if you've got a, a, a you know like a domain type of network infrastructure, um, you can actually manage that uh, globally with things like uh, Windows Update Server and, and things like that, uh, right, Alex? Yep, uh, WSUS or um, Mender exists for Windows servers as well. Uh, those kinds of things uh, we use. Um, uh, there's a a paid for service that we use because we deploy based on uh, uh, not across the entire domain. So like we have machines that are designated as office machines and studio machines and engineering PCs and lab or production. So we can control which updates go to which deployment based on our schedule and availability because we don't right. want to mass deploy to our production network like we would our lab network to see what breaks. Right. Um, let's see, Ray asked, what's everybybody's favorite antivirus they're using Defender and he liked uh, cat, cat Capers, I always Kapersky. get it wrong. Kapersky. Thank Kapersky. you. I get it wrong every darn time. Um, that's okay. You don't want to hear me uh, pronounce McAfee either, but uh... no, you did pretty good. <laughs> now say what's the yeah, sauce? I mean, potato, potato. I mean, you just mentioned two names that probably shouldn't be trusted anymore. But uh... <laughs> Sophos is good. Um, Sophos. Yeah, Sophos, uh, Windows actually, believe it or not, uh, the the fear of the DOJ has straightened Microsoft out for Windows Defender pretty well. Defender is um, surprisingly good there? these days. No, but it does I mean, the trick a lot of times. Yeah, it's certainly better than than nothing at all, as we've had yep. in the past. But you know, Defender is pretty much on by default in in every Windows install. But now, so. the one that I like it depends on. Sorry, it depends if you're looking for a single standard, because of course, yeah. uh, right. Windows if is Windows. Doing it, and if you're doing it enterprise wide, you have to you know kind of find the best of both worlds. What if you're a mixed environment like we are at WPR where we have to find one that works both on Mac, PC, and Linux? You know, we gotta go yeah, across right. the gamut uh, yeah. because it's required by IT security. Right. So that will dictate what your options are. But as far as quote unquote the best, that's like ask, asking what audio processor is the best. It's a religious yeah. question. Ford, IT Ford versus Chevy is what I put, but yeah. Yep. Um, Kirk has <laughs> provided the directions to go into group uh, group editing for the, or for group admin for the um, deferring updates on uh, Windows 10. It has to be Windows 10 professional. Uh, it's a really long description. So uh, by all means, if anybody's interested and wants that, then uh, we're going to, uh, we're going, then I'll, I'll send it to you. Send me an email and I'll fire it on out. Um, Alex, yeah. I want to thank you for the Windows. input. Uh, let's see, we're running close to 10 to the top of the hour. 
So I am going to move ahead just a little bit. And uh, folks, as always, we're not going to finish. I, and I got called out on this last week. As almost always, we're not going to uh, finish this at the top of the hour. We'll probably go a little late. Uh, this will be archived. So if you uh, need to go, we'll understand. Uh, let's see, William, suggestion, ability to disable the network connection via a GPI so I can only have, only have the transmitter on when I want it to be. Oh, there's a cool one, Matt. So it's something to write down on your list, the ability to front panel disable network connectivity. So I actually saw somebody at a studio who had built a device for exactly that purpose. It was literally a little rack mount widget that they built that had Ethernet passing through it, and hmm. they could select whether or not that connection was physically enabled, which is actually, right. I thought it was kind of a cool idea, actually. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and it is a cool one because like right now, for example, on most of our boxes, unless you've set a loopback address in them, when you unplug the network connection, you will get a host network not responding alarm. So yeah. by being able to front panel software disable network connectivity, then you could uh, bypass that alarm. The, uh, the, the, most, the Dell firewall that we were looking for that Alex couldn't remember the name of was Sonic Wall. Thanks, Kirk. Oh uh, yes. So. The, okay, sorry, I was going to say that the uh, the network connection thing, and it doesn't solve the network thing, um, but the remote local uh, feature is is one that uh, is uh, a, a local thing and and prevents uh, a, de a degree of interaction with the transmitter itself. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I do agree that that's kind of a cool thing. But having a remote way of controlling your network connections is really the crucial part, uh, which is part of your infrastructure, um, right. which would be cool. Yeah. Uh, let's see. LTSC update. Apply on next reboot can catch you if you try to reboot a machine within a short window, because sometimes it can take a while to update to apply. And that's a good point. Um, you know, uh, if updates are pending, your reboot may or may not happen in a couple of seconds versus a couple and of minutes. Is it possible that is it also possible that you can have layered updates, in which case it has to reboot and then start again and then do another one and another one? So I yep. don't know if yep. they're if uh, they're designed to be more monolithic yep. always, or uh, you could and end and up I don't in a bit on, of a loop. Uh, yeah, on LTSC, I don't know. Uh, let's see, encryption keys. Ransomware depends on DNS to get the latest encryption keys. I'm told that open DNS or other DNS services that won't forward you to know there are, oh, I'm told that using open DNS or other DNS services that won't forward you to known ransomware sites. Um, thoughts on that, Kirk, or Kirk, Shane? That, that was Kirk's comment. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure specifically about, uh, about open DNS or Google DNS or some of these others um, in terms of how they block that, but I know there are several uh, public DNS providers out there uh, that will, you know, block DN known DNS entries for, uh, for malware sites and various other things. And, and yeah, it, it really does, it really does help. So, you know, just another, another tool in the, you know, in the arsenal for defending right. against this stuff. And uh, Tim had a uh, question about um, security of uh, comments on security of TeamViewer. And I mean, so T TeamViewer is a VNC, a virtual network connection, and it's less secure than a VPN, but more secure than nothing at all. That, that That's my synopsis in a nutshell. They've gotten better. My biggest complaint about TeamViewer is their subscription model, but uh, that's another discussion entirely. Yep. Yep, yep, and I mean that's uh, as you said earlier, that's a uh, a conversation that we're probably going to end up having more and more in in various aspects of our industry. Um, so the slide I put up now, this is the home network taken about a month or so ago when I was uh, doing a similar presentation for the SBE, and as you can see, just on port scanning. Now that was a slow week. Uh, my th this is my the mesh network here at the house. And uh, I have topped over a million port scans in a week before. So, um, you know, there are a lot of folks out there doing a lot of looking. And uh, yeah, we need to, let's see. Now, William mentions uh, Cloudflare DNS works very well, that they have uh, versions that block the bad stuff. Uh, Alex mentions that good ones use RBLs constantly, Google, Verizon, HE, et cetera. So, we use Cloudflare um, yeah. for our websites. That's our there you go. Cool. Here, Good to so. know. Um, so, like I said, it, it's a known 
I mean, it was, uh, and this may be one of those, uh, what do you call it? Um, urban legend type things like a Nautel urban legend. But the, the, the story I got that was that we, uh, when we um, had uh, an, an NV5, so five kilowatts sitting on a floor in the office in Quincy, um, that they'd uh, connected it past the firewall just to public internet and that it was 19 seconds before it was compromised. So um, yeah. again, you got to use some security. Um, I, I have similar stories with, with audio codecs, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and, and like I said, that, that one brand we were talking about with the pre-2017, I mean, if you click on the IP address, just happen to hit the IP address, if you know what you're looking at, you, you, you're there automatically. Um, so this was the wall of text, and I'm not going to read it, but the, the things that uh, Shane had uh, <laughs> requested in an email, and um, I, I did uh, take the um, liberty to a bridge a little bit here and there. But um, so we talked about critical updates. We did not talk much about a basic uh, NAT or port filtering firewall. So um, that's a, it's a double-edged sword. <laughs> So there's there's at least one manufacturer I know that does have that uh, feature and does have it enabled by default. Uh, but like you said, it is kind of a double-edged sword because by default they block HTTP, but not HTTPS. And if you aren't aware of that and don't explicitly go to HTTPS and then the IP address, it's going to look at you like you're dumb and go, huh? So. So um, let's see, and strong passwords, of course, we've beaten that one up too. Um, Alex mentions that internet drive-bys are always going to happen if you have a confident fire, competent firewall, be it at home or in the office, disable ICMP, ping and trace route on the WAN interface response. And that's a uh, good, uh, good point. So uh, I'm going to click back real quick to the slide of my network, and you'll notice that if I ping using Shodan, ping my own IP address, I can't find it. Now, I was not in the house at the time I pinged it. I was I was pinging the IP address for my router. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, again, pretty well protected. I'm still, I used to publicize that IP address, not doing that anymore, um, just because. Uh, you know, sometimes you have to walk the walk at least a little bit. But uh, that is a good point, too. Um, and this is something, I'm going to throw this out there at Matt. Uh, the first iteration we did of a software controlled transmitter, one with an operating system in it, we basically left everything open by default and relied on people shutting them down in the firewall. Um, now I know that in the newer one, we've uh, gone a little further toward uh, shutting down services that we're not using. Um, so <laughs> Alex makes a boy, that was a bad idea comment, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that is something that we're changing a little bit. Yes. Yeah. The, right now, the only thing, if you want, it, you're talking about seeing the AUI from outside. Well, yeah. The, yeah. Through a firewall. The operating system in general. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, you only need one, one port to be visible now as you start layering other services. Uh, you will need something for SNMP, you will need something for uh, HTTPS, I believe, and uh, things like that. But, um, you know, that's out of our control, I think. Um, so, yeah. yeah, you have to do the right things for that. Right. And I mean, this was just an example of a, a scan. I, and I, I put the picture of the Omnia Volt up there just because that was one of the things behind one of those ports. But, uh, this, sorry, Kirk. But, but yeah, it... Um, you know, the, these were a couple of IP addresses with a whole bunch of stuff visible. And and so in response to Shane's wall of text, Matt threw his own wall of text out. Of and course. Uh, again, <laughs> not going to um, read everything, but the challenge, and, and this comes back to what I said before, <laughs> the more secure, secure you make it, the harder it is to use. Whether it's talking like uh, Ray was saying earlier with how long it takes to log into your computer in the morning or whether it's uh, what do you have to do to get your transmitter running. So, um, you know, it, it's definitely a compromise. Uh, let's see. Keith's got me. Uh, here we go. 
All right, I'm going to read what Keith's got. One station I work for is university utilizes a large firewall for the university overwall, now requiring the radio station within the university to have its own firewall within the university network. This is overkill, question mark. I can see problems ahead with this, such as trying to VPN into the radio station, wondering if it we'll, would require a multi-layer VPN. And that's a good question. So firewall within a firewall. Um, Shane, thoughts on that? So I've actually worked in, in a university environment. I know, Alex, you, you do as well. Um, and I know several others here probably do as well. But um, it depends on how it's implemented. Um, it can be done. And it can be done in such a way that it's it's not overly cumbersome. Um, but I mean, it's almost, I wouldn't do VPN within a VPN. That's just asking for trouble. Um, but uh, I mean, if you work with the IT department, I mean, perhaps it's to the point where they actually insist that you um, that you literally have your own external connection uh, for that firewall. In that case, you know, you, you're able to get to your own stuff, but nothing else. Um, and it really does. It really does depend on the implementation. Yeah, Alex, I got you unmuted again. Uh, you got some thoughts on that? I see you had some comments in there. Yeah, I mean, it's it's for for mine at KVSC. What we did is that the university is my internet service provider and in order to protect me from the university and the university from me is that I have a straight through connection to the outside world going to my firewall but to access university resources they have a firewall in between us so that if I plug in in like the hockey center or a dormitory I can't get to my own network without having a network administrator let me through so I'm protecting myself against you know thousands potentially of uneducated users in the dorms or mm -hmm. professors who don't know better or astronomers who think their app is the coolest thing they just downloaded from itself so no it's not the worst thing in the world it's a nightmare for management because now you have to rely on two teams of management but um, knowing your IT security people at that level is paramount and you have a good working relationship with that That's person huge. to make that work yeah. Now, now, somebody did make the comment that the university really needs the protection from Alex more than vice versa. <laughs> um, that's why that yeah. model exists, Brian, because yes, I've done that before. Yeah. So <laughs> on that note, uh, thanks again, Alex. I just say I just uh, saw you put the comment in and it, it applied. Um, so, Matt, real quick on your end, is there anything in this whole conversation that's kind of raised any flags as to things that for various reasons we just simply can't do or or would really rather not do can't is a, a very strong word yeah i no i i think i'm more interested in hearing what what people need of the system and uh and is what we're what i've talked about going in the right direction and is there or and you know while we have to listen to the very broad range of users that we have are there things that you would like us to harden or soften um and then you know, should VPN be built into the transmitter or, yeah, I don't know, whatever wacky ideas there might be out there, um, is there something that we can make it better? Um, and, uh, but uh, I'm very interested in hearing what people are looking for, uh, as opposed to saying, hey, we're going to do this, um, because uh, we have limited resources. And if we do the right things, because we hear what people want, as opposed to the wrong things by guessing. Now that That's just yeah. goofy. And, and I mean, we typically, we do come out and ask you all a lot uh, when we have ideas like this, but uh, by all means, if you've got any suggestions or solutions or thoughts along that, uh, Matt, where's the best place to send them? Oh, matt.herden at nortel.com. So M-A-T-T -T dot H-E-R-D-O-N at nortel.com. If you can't spell nortel, it's uh, on my shirt. There you um, go. <laughs> <laughs> and Herden does not have an N in the middle. There's only one N in, in, in Herden. So, uh, yeah, it's not Herndon, which is very popular. Oh, and Spellcheck will attempt to do that. Good too. to know. Good to know. <clears throat> All right. So, moving on real quick. Uh, one other thing. And, uh, of course, we talked a lot about, like, Windows, Windows 10, Windows 11, LTSC, Defender, et cetera, and so on. But uh, <laughs> this is from Crawford uh, Broadcasting's uh, newsletter. And uh, I asked permission to use this quote because uh, Stephen made a really good point that this is not just a Windows challenge anymore. You know, as uh, I mean, of course, we use Linux in the operating system for most of our boxes now, various iterations depending on the transmitter. 
Um, there's a lot of, well, if you're running Rivendell, you're based on running on the Linux system. There are a bunch of other Linux apps out there. So uh, yeah, there are becoming more and more vulnerabilities, I guess, that, uh, that we need to address. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. We got two or three minutes left to go. Since Matt's here, when's the new AUI coming? <laughs> Real soon. <laughs> Thanks, Marco. <laughs> no, the, uh, the uh, challenge that we had, uh, which the people who've been on the beta and people who've been communicating with me directly, uh, and uh, uh, I keep promising an update, um, we ran into some very nasty little things. And we had a, a beta 3 for the VS ready right before NAB, and then we found some problems. And they were ones to do with the boot cycle, and they would brick your transmitter, and so we had to fix those. And uh, I, it turns out I'm really good at testing stuff. I would put stuff on the thing behind me, and uh, magically I would find things to break. And as a result, they've been actively fixing the whole thing. And, it, and the, the good news is the VX, VS, which is the same as MV Lite and uh, NX pretty much, uh, they share the same processor. So the challenges that we face with the VS are we're, we're fixing it for those ones as well. It's a massive installed base. We've got, you know, between those ones, we're over t probably around 10,000 or close to 10,000 transmitters in the worldwide distribution and, uh, and operational. So for us to take this lightly and just say, hey, good enough, here, have it go for it. It was a bad idea. So uh, we're, we're, we've are we been chewing through those. Uh, I I kind of asked yesterday, it's like, okay, I think we're good, right? You know, can you give me a, a beta three? And they're just doing the final touches to that. And so I'm hoping to have beta three for the VS very shortly. Um, and that really will trigger so much more. Um, it's been relatively easy to do it for this guy, the VX in parallel. Um, because it's got a much more beefy processor and uh, and, and all that kind of good stuff. Um, so that's that's something that we've. So it's running. It's running. You know, we've got it running on a GV. We got it running on a VS and and the VS and VS and VX. Um, so you know, the progress has been ex excellent. Just not as fast as we would like it to be because I'm good at finding problems. Hey, that's my job. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. I love it. So let, let's see. Uh, one other thing, um, and I showed you the scan from my network mesh network a little while ago, and of course uh, Al Alex uh, sent me the screen cap for Pi-hole a, a while back. Um, but uh, it's great to have all this defense, but if you don't know whether you're what you, you need to be look monitoring your system. You know, it's like documenting your system. If you don't know what you're whether you're being threatened. Then I mean, these days I guess it's not a matter of if; it's a matter of how badly. But uh, but definitely, it's a good idea to to keep an eye on it too. Um, all right, closing remarks, Shane. Any final thoughts? Uh, things that you really need to see Matt put into the next iteration of whatever he develops. <laughs> I think we pretty well covered them in my in my tome of text there. Um, but uh, no, it's good to see manufacturers finally starting to kind of uh, pay attention to uh, to the IT security element of things. Um, and I'm hoping that broadcasters can kind of take a cue as well, even small broadcasters, and and kind of uh, kind of go in the same direction. And uh, just a quick shout out, I'm not going to unmute you, but Kirk uh, Harnack from Telos Alliance, thanks very much for your input today as well. Um, speaking of uh, manufacturers who are, are putting some uh, some oversight into this. Uh, Matt, final thoughts on your end. What do you need to see from um, folks to make your job easier? Well, I, I used to be a product manager for a password managing system. So I think the biggest thing I can say to people is change your damn password. So, um, because uh, I think it's really important and it's the simplest, most straightforward thing you can do to protect your systems um, yeah. and uh, and uh, store them in your head or on a piece of paper somewhere secure too. So, uh, yeah. um, but I really appreciate all the feedback and, and I really welcome unvarnished feedback to me in that email address. I know that's asking for it, but that's my job. I'm a product manager and I'm very happy to do that. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, um, Marco almost made, <laughs> Alex says, hold my beer. Um, 
Al, or Marco uh, made the comment that uh, they uh, use a third-party IT company to look after IT security, and that is a really good point. And this is a discussion that we had before when we did the uh, IT security session back in the spring. Um, we, we did four or five sessions on it. But uh, there are going to be situations where farming out the IT security to, uh, to a third party company that specializes in that is your best solution. Um, now, the challenge, make sure that they're educated on the needs of broadcast and the fact that you don't pull an automation system down for half an hour in the middle of afternoon drive, you know, without uh, really making sure that somebody is aware of this well ahead of time. So, uh, yeah. so you know, you, you just can't blindly say, okay, handle our IT security and then not let them know what your priorities are. So I found that a lot of these... Oh. I was going to say, I found that a lot of the a lot of these IT types are actually very curious about our applications, really want to understand them, really want to know them. So form those relationships and definitely, you know, make sure that you're you're on the same page, whether it's somebody that you bring in externally or whether it's somebody in house. Right. The Matt? the other option, which is kind of a halfway house, is where you have an IT the security review company. So you can have a third party come in and sort of do an uh, an, an audit and kind of go, yeah, you're terrible, or actually you're pretty good. You just need to do this, this, and this. Um, and that's I think we did that at Nortel, and we uh, did. So yep. That led and, uh, that and, led to and, a bunch and, of changes. Well, right, and I mean there were several of them things we knew we had to do. Several of them are things that we just weren't aware of. Um, yep, edumacation, it helps. Also, quick shout out to Mr. Disembodied Voice, Edward Sylvester, who's been uh, tweaking me in the chat to remind me to of various things because he knows that I forget everything. But right. uh, folks, if there's any topic that you want to see us cover over the new year, then by all means, reach out, shoot me an email, jwelton, J-W-E-L-T-O-N at nautel.com, or you can throw it to info at nautel.com and it'll get to me eventually. Um, actually, Krista's really good at getting that stuff out there right away. But uh, definitely shoot us an email with any topic. On that note, this archive or this webinar, as with all of our webinars, will be archived. Um, you can get to it under the resources tab of our website. Got the Waves newsletter. There was one out uh, about a month ago. Um, YouTube, actually, I think I was talking about IT security in the article I did for the Waves newsletter. So also cool. Um, I'll be on Barry Mishkin's uh, BDR day after tomorrow i forget what we're talking about barry gave me some suggestions but we'll have some fun so folks on that note i want to take uh, this opportunity shane thanks so much i mean you're way out on the far far west coast on the left coast if you will so i know it's really dark 30 there i mean it's uh, just barely uh, breakfast time so thanks very much for taking the time uh, anytime always always a pleasure and Matt, I, I mean, I know you've got lots to do beyond talking to us, so I appreciate your time as well. You're welcome. And definitely you folks, thank you all for being here. And we will see you. Let's see. I We have no session next week. I'm on the road. A uh, week after that, the 13th, we'll be doing, I think it's a war story session, talking about for different transmitter sites, what went sideways and what we could have done to fix it. So until then, we'll see you later. Thank you all. Have a great day. Bye now. Have a good one.